Are you thinking of leaving corporate, but too afraid to make the move? Have you already escaped corporate, but are finding it hard to run your dream business? Are you wasting valuable time by attempting to figure challenges out on your own? We have created a podcast for corporate escapees running their own business. This is the Corporate Escapees Podcast by Build, Live, Give. We bring you firsthand experiences of guests going through many of the struggles you face each and every day as a corporate escapee. We get real with no corporate BS. And now over to your host, Paul Higgins. Welcome to BLG Experts, where we're a community of corporate escapees helping each other to build our dream business. And during that journey, we come through a lot of challenges. And uh, some of those challenges faced, we get global experts like the guest that's going to be introduced in a moment onto the show to help our community to rapidly grow their business. And it's all based off the five rapid growth drivers. So if you go to buildlivegive.com forward slash roadmap, and that will also be in the show notes, you can get what those are. But today, we, in particular, we're going to focus on the rapid growth driver number two, which is called Ideal client and we've got a global expert on today's show to talk about it so her name is Jean Ginsberg from Gin Ball Digital Marketing and she's going to take us through some of the most common challenges and solutions around finding your ideal client which as I said it's uh, number two in our framework and I think it's absolutely critical so um, what I'll do now is uh, hand you over to Jean so Jean uh, welcome to the podcast Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. And I too am a corporate SKP. I was in the corporate world uh, five years ago and decided to quit my job and decided to start my own business. So I am very familiar with what that's all about. Yeah, well, well done. I know it's, uh, it took me 10 years to, uh, to do that. And it takes many and probably many listening to this uh, just started their journey. So well done for you for, uh, for making that step. It's, uh, it's great that you're uh, contributing to the world in the way that you are. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I thank you for having me as a guest. And I can talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I know how that sounds <laughs> kind of but. Uh, bombus there, but you know, I'm going to say a few words, uh, just kind of introduce myself. Um, so I'm Jean Ginsberg, and I am a digital marketing expert. I've been doing digital marketing for 11 years, and uh, the last five years, as I mentioned, I started my own company. And uh, we work with small to medium sized companies and help them grow their businesses using digital marketing. Uh, I would call it a digital marketing consultancy is what I I founded. And it's it's just a very very rewarding experience uh, for me. And I love seeing businesses grow and thrive. So that's uh, that's what I've been up to. And I also just recently published a new book, which is called Win New Customers, How to Attract, Connect, and Convert More Prospects into Customers in 60 Days Using Digital Marketing. And it was number one uh, Amazon bestseller. So congratulations. Yeah, so it's, it's, well done. Thank you very much. It's been a busy last uh, 12 months here for me. So, uh, But the book has been uh, a, just a, an, an amazing experience. And I wanted to share what I've been doing with my private clients over the last several years. And I I thought, you know, there's no point in keeping it all to myself. A lot of people can benefit from what I know and not make the same mistakes that I made over the last um, several years. So I thought it would make sense for me to put it all into a a little book. It's actually only 85 pages and, and share the knowledge that I and uh, the experience that I've had. So that way, you can just take that knowledge instead of <laughs> trial and error, like the way I did it. So, brilliant, um, Jane. Jane, just on that, because uh, look, a lot of our um, community of what do they say? Everyone's got a book in them, but not many release it. And I think our <laughs> community is uh, very much like that. I'm like that myself. So, what was the key thing that sort of got you past that hurdle of, you know, releasing that book, finally doing it? Eleven years. I'm assuming it took you ten or or whatever to uh, to decide to release a book. What got you across the line? You know, funny enough, it did. It took me only about a year to come up with the idea that I wanted to release a book. And then the following, so I think this was about 2016, I started talking to people that I know and, and colleagues and peers in my in my digital marketing group that I was like, oh, I, I think I'd like to write a book soon. 
eventually. I, I didn't, at that point, didn't really have a solid plan for it. But I knew that in my mind, I wanted to write a book. And it took about a, a year just to think about it. It took about four months to actually write the book. I started last May. So right now we're in tw- beginning of 2018. And I started in uh, May of 2017. And really what I think the kind of the stars aligned for me is what I like to say. I met somebody who was a, a coach who helps uh, people like myself, entrepreneurs, write books and and like nonfiction books, something about a, you know, a very specific topic. So mine is about digital marketing. And he helped me with the process and I think just for me it was like okay I think it it makes sense it's going with the flow like I met someone who can help me and I just pushed through it so I uh, he I mean obviously I did all the work myself he kind of just walked me through as as being a coach but I went back I I wrote all of the the actual uh, chapters I had my editor go through them I went through them of course several times um, the one, the one thing I would say, the one little secret that I would share with your audiences is that um, one of the easier ways to write a book is not by actually writing it, like in, sitting in front of your computer and having a, a word, a blank word page in front of you. Uh, my recommendation would be to first outline the book. So let's say you want to have ten chapters in your book. You want to outline, you know, what's the name of the first chapter? Maybe some like five bullet points that you want to talk about in each chapter. So do that first. And then what you do is you speak your book or you speak your chapter into a recording device, say your iPhone or any other recording device. And then six to eight minutes is typically the, 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 the length of a chapter. And then what you do is you get it transcribed. You can get them transcribed for like a dollar a minute. Um, there's many um, platforms out there that would allow you to do that. And that's the basis, the foundation of your work. Obviously, you have to go back through and get it edited by a professional, and you have to probably go through it several times. But that is my little trick. Brilliant. That's, uh, that's great. I think that's a, a great tip. And um, if you don't mind me asking, like, roughly how much did it cost to uh, from conception, the coach, to, to through, like, roughly – as a ballpark, because I'm sure a lot of listeners are saying, look, I'd love to get a coach and I'd love to do it the way you're doing it, but oh, it might be a little bit outside my budget. So if you can just give people a guide on that. Absolutely. So I will be, I'll be honest, uh, the the coach that I had, we did a work trade. Um, I helped him with a digital with his digital marketing and he helped me with uh, the uh, the book writing and the Amazon piece of it. So we, I I don't know exactly what it would have cost me if I were to actually get his services and, and pay for them directly. Um, and the other piece of it is that I did obviously the marketing all myself, so I didn't have to pay for a marketing person to do it. So those are the two caveats that I will have to put into the price before I, I tell you what I actually spent on it. So I spent uh, probably about 2000 US dollars on it, including that included my editor, which was about 700 US dollars. So uh, and I don't know, I thought it was pretty inexpensive, but again, I did all my marketing myself. I came up with all of the strategies I executed on all of them. So I, again, it might be a little bit different for the individuals who are listening, who are not digital marketing experts and would have to hire someone out to do the digital marketing or the marketing for them. Oh, brilliant. Look, uh, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And ideal clients. So obviously when you were writing the book, you had, uh, your ideal clients sort of take us through what you see as some of the key challenges Uh, that people have when they're defining their ideal client? Absolutely. So one of the chapters in my book is all about the ideal client, the target market, because one of the things that I find when I engage with clients uh, of my own is that, you know, everybody really wants to do the marketing and they want to just jump head first and, and get some more clients. But what I find is that a lot of times they don't really know who those clients should be or are and so it becomes difficult to do the marketing when you're when you're not sure who the ideal target market is because then all the messaging all the marketing materials that you're creating might not be for the right target for the right market so it's it's extremely i'd say one of the most important things is to identify who your target market is because um, you might have an amazing ad really great copy you know, a super cool video that you all put together, but if it's all for the wrong market, then this is all in vain. And it, no matter how great it is, it will not work. I will, I've seen it before. So 
I just can't stress enough how important I feel that uh, identifying your target market is before you really get into the digital marketing. So, um, so we're going to talk about a, a lot about today, that piece today, the how to identify who your target market is. So I would say, um, you know, the challenges that I have found, as I, as I mentioned just now, you know, you might be creating your, your messages, your Facebook ads or whatever, but you're just not getting the sales, for example, because the, the problem could be you're not identifying your target market, or maybe you're creating content, but again, getting little or no attention, or perhaps you're posting your content on social media, but getting little or no engagement. So I, so those, so some of these are some of the challenges I've seen um, in general, like on, let's say Facebook groups, or even with my own clients that I've uh, taken on. And so it's, uh, you know, we want to, of course, address that. And we want to make sure that in the future, <laughs> we don't have that kind of problem. So one of, uh, one of the main ways on how to address that problem is to is to identify, of course, your ideal target market. So I would say we, we can start off with, um, you know, the very, the very easy things like age, gender, geolocation, household income. So we can identify the, the demographic data. And I think that's a good start, but it is not the end of this. This is just the beginning. And a lot of times I feel like, oh, I could just identify, you know, businesses might say, I'll identify, you know, just what the age is, the gender, where they live, and I'm good to go. But that's that's not at all. We this is just the start of the uh, beginning of how we want to move forward and identify our, our ideal target market. Um, then, yeah, and just oh, go ahead. sorry, sorry, Jane, just on that. Um, look, I, I often, uh, you know, as part of our second, which is the ideal client, I, I'll ask people who their ideal client and. They'll give me an answer and I'll say, so look, on rough calculation, I think that could be a half a billion people. They sort of exactly. Strangely, and they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you, you've just given me such a generic answer that I think you're targeting about a half a billion people. So how can we get it that you're actually targeting a thousand people? So how can you be so prescriptive that there's a thousand people? If you had to get a thousand people in a room and you had to individually invite each of them, how would you describe the people you'd want in that room? And uh, I think that then brings it from something that's nice, big and esoteric into something that is uh, more tangible. What, what are your thoughts or, or comments um, when I've gone through that as a, as a methodology we use? I absolutely agree with that. One of the common mistakes I see is that um, businesses, business owners think that, yeah, the bro broader I go, the best it is. It's actually quite the opposite. You want to niche down as much as you can and get that right message in front of the right people. And you don't want to be doing it to half a billion people. You want to be doing it to close to uh, more in the range of a thousand people instead of half a billion. So absolutely agreed. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think it's, um, you know, and I think that's the temptation where, you know, you can reach a, a massive audience, but I heard um, someone on a, a podcast yesterday saying that, um, you know, they had, you know, millions of, of fans and now they've, sort of basically gone back to just getting core. So they'd rather core quality of really passionate fans that are actually engaged, listening, watching their material and actually doing something than the metrics, the vein metrics of having lots of people. Now I'm sure you hear that a lot, but what, what's, um, what sort of your, have you got an example where, where that happened with you consulting to, uh, to one of your clients? Where we started off and they were very broad and then we, and we narrowed it down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that happens. I would say that's pretty much happened to most of the clients that I've engaged with is that I, when I first came in and engaged with them, their ideal target market was pretty broad. And so going through uh, these, uh, these solutions that I'm, that I'm going through with, with you now, and the first being like you know, identifying your age and, and, and gender and geolocation as household income is, is one of is the first step in, in the worksheet that um, that I do with all of my clients. And then we really narrow it down. And, and so the next step, um, I can kind of go through the worksheet, is uh, we also identify psychographics. So pain points, challenges, values, and goals. And it's, uh, it's extremely important to identify the pain points and challenges and frustrations, because part of why we maybe have a product or service is that we are trying to solve a, a problem for our prospective customer or client. So they might have a problem or a challenge or a pain point, and 
the idea is our service or product will, will solve it for them. So it's important to identify those pain points and challenges because if you can include that into your marketing materials, then it makes, uh, it, makes it a lot easier for them to connect with you and, and understand, hey, this company, this person, this expert, this consultant or whatever understands that I'm having this challenge and it seems like they can solve it for me with their product or service. So step two is really getting into the psychographics. Yeah, and then look, a lot of, uh, I think that's it's really sound advice, but a lot of people say, well, how do I do that? And I'm not quite sure if you're just about to go into that, but um, people, you know, I often find people project their own um, pain points, fears, et cetera, rather than getting real real comments from real clients or prospective clients and also uh, their language. Uh, what have you found uh, useful to be able to get past that? Absolutely. So I say take the guesswork out of it. Yes, a lot of times, uh, I'd say very often I work with uh, business owners and they guess and rely on hunches and say, I think that my target market is you know XYZ and their problems are ABC. Well, uh, the thing is we want to rely on data and not on hunches or guesses because that's because the data is really what's going to speak. It's going to speak for itself. And so the way to do that, the way to understand um, what is uh, you know beyond again the gender and the age and the geolocation, really understanding what are their challenges and pain points, is to survey your current customers. So there's a number of ways you can do that. You can do that through email. So if you have already a customer list, then uh, it is pretty easy to create a survey and then send it out. Um, one of the ways I always have my clients uh, do this is also I have them get on the phone and talk to, I'd say at least 20 customers who have purchased their product or service in the past. And I, I actually ask them to do both. I ask my clients to do both, like get on the phone with with customers who you think will give you raving reviews, but also get on the phone with customers who maybe have bought for you, but were not very happy. And the reason for that is we want to identify why did these customers purchase? What were their what were, what were they like before they purchased this product or service? And then what were they like after? Because these, again, are important pieces to put into your marketing materials when you're trying to draw in more prospective clients. Yeah, I think that uh, that makes uh, perfect sense. And, and look, I know uh, a lot of people might be listening to this and saying, look, I'm struggling to get my open rates up on emails anyway, and that's when I'm you know, trying to get people to be customers you know, how do I encourage people to actually first open my emails, but secondly, uh, actually answer a survey? What incentive or, or how can I get them to be more engaged with those surveys? Absolutely. That is a good point. Uh, um, unfortunately, um, email open rates have been on a downward trajectory over the last, oh, I don't know, probably a while. I mean, it's slowly, slowly on a downward trajectory, but it is, I feel like, getting to the point where it is hard to get people to open. I'd say um, subject lines, of course, are going to be, uh, creative subject lines are going to be the way for people to open, for, for customers to open your emails. In terms of incentives, I um I would say that you know we we there is definitely a fine line there. We don't want to create a, such an incentive where people uh, or customers are just filling out these surveys and and not giving you really good data uh, because they just want the incentive. Um, so I'd say maybe like what I've used in the past is uh, maybe having a drawing for an Amazon gift card or something along those lines, where if you fill out the survey, then you you'll be automatically put into a drawing for an Amazon gift card of 50 or $100 or something like that. So it gives them a, an opportunity to, you know, you, you want to you wanna be on that fine line there, but not really go either way because, of course, you want sound data, but also you want to um, have these customers fill out the, the surveys in the end, right? Yeah, and Jane, is there any particular time? So from, let's say, you know, first day they purchase, and let's say uh, a lot of our people provide consulting services similar to yourself. So they've just got a new consulting client. When is it the right time to get feedback from them about the service that you're providing or, you know, as we're talking here, the, the, sem the um, you know, around their pain points, et cetera? Sure. I think it depends on the kind of product or service that you're offering. So if um, 
if you're a business and you sell shoes, it might be fine to email your uh, customer two days after they, you know, they received their pair of shoes because at that point they probably have tried them on and you know are excited about it. But if it's a more complex service, then it really depends. Um, you know, sometimes I engage with clients um, and have several months where we're working on a specific project. Um, so I would say at the end of that big project, you probably would want to get their feedback um, since you've already completed it at that point. It, you know, it depends on how um, audience these audiences that are listening to this podcast are actually structuring their services. Um, sometimes it's just a one-off meeting, right? Maybe you're doing just a, a one-day strategic session with your client. And so that's, I think it's appropriate to send them an email a couple days later and say, Hey, you know, what is your, what's your feedback been? How did you like the session? Is there anything I can do to improve? So I think it, it depends. Mm, but I think timely, I think that's a really good example of uh, big projects. And uh, we, uh, when, when I worked at Coca-Cola, we had the top air, um, uh, top guns in, which were basically F-18 pilots. And after every critical mission, they have a, uh, a debrief. Uh, so it's called a no rank debrief and they do what, what, what went well on the mission and what could improve and there's no rank. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter if you're a general or you're the person putting the chalk under the, the, the wheel of the plane, you get the opportunity to do that. So I think uh, that works really well. And, uh, and just ask people, like even at the end of my uh, podcast, I always ask people, you know, what did you really like about this process and what could we do to improve? And it's those little increments I think make a difference and it can help get this information through the journey where I think some people think it's just a, well, I've said it and that's it. You know, I've come up with my ideal client. I don't need to ever go back and, and do it. But I think with your process, they can actually, you know, it's a, it's a constant learning. It's not a one-off. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is this worksheet that I do with my clients. Um, the one I'm going through right now um, is, is should be a living, breathing document. It is not uh, a, just a one-off type of thing. It is something that, and, and again, your clients, as you, as you learn about more about them might actually change. And so you, you might have to change or update some of the points in your uh, ideal target market or your customer avatar worksheet. So it's uh, it's not just a, a one and done. This is something we should all revisit at least uh, once a quarter. And if you know if there's no changes, absolutely no problem. Just put it, review it, put it back away, and then review it again in a quarter without any changes. But there might be there might be some changes. Um, it also depends. You know, you might have new products, uh, new services. Um, maybe you want to change your dynamic in your business as well. So it's, uh, it, there's could be many reasons as to why this customer avatar worksheet might be ever flowing and, and ever changing. Fantastic. So that's one and two. What's the, uh, the third step? And the third step is pinpointing the sources of information. So, um, especially with Facebook advertising, one of uh, the main ways is, is using the targeting uh, to functionality within Facebook that allows you to find this ideal target market. And so we want to really understand what are, for example, the blogs that our target market is reading, what are, who are the gurus that they follow, what are the events they're attending, maybe they're attending conferences or they're attending um, Tony Robbins events or uh, you know, there's many different, different events out there. Uh, what publications are they reading? Are they reading magazines? Are they reading online publications? It's also important because it also could uh, identify which generation they're part of. Um, what social media channels are they using? Are they using Facebook? Are they using Snapchat? Are they using Instagram? Because again, those are also some generational gaps there because Facebook is more designed for people who are in their 30s and 40s because we uh, we kind of started with whole, this whole Facebook thing about 10 years ago when we were back in our, you know, typically in the 20s and now we're 30s and 40s. And then for Snapchat, for example, those are kids who are in their, you know, early 20s or maybe even sometimes teens. So there's definitely uh, the social media channels will also help you identify approximately what kind of generational um, uh, piece or I guess the, the generation that, that your customer ideal target market is in. Great. And sort of getting that information, is that something that someone like yourself, a consultant, is best to do or can the business owner themselves get that information? 
I, of course, the business owner themselves can get the information. The, uh, the, I guess the next step would be like, how do you use that information? And if you know how to use that information, absolutely. Then go ahead, take the next step, whatever that might be. Maybe you're, you want to do Facebook advertising. Maybe you want to um, write some communications to your prospects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the, the point is that, yes, if you, you can identify the data. That's fantastic. But also, you would need to know how to use that data. And that could be you as the business owner, or you can hire an expert to do that for you. Okay, excellent. And uh, is there another step in this great process? Um, no, that's pretty much the three steps is, uh, first getting demographic data, psycho, then step two is psychographic data. So that would be pain points, challenges, values, goals. And then step three is the sources of information. So blogs, events, publications, social media channels, channels. So yeah, I would say those are the main, three main steps that I use with my clients when we're working on the customer avatar worksheet. And this is this is the data that we use for the communications, the emails, um, the, co- the copy that we're writing for, for email, for Facebook advertising. This is the videos that we're creating. So we're using all of this information uh, to to create all of our marketing materials, whatever they might be. Great. And look, you've given, you know, lots of really good tips there, but anything else that, you know, you constantly see clients, if, I don't know if you, you know, some clients have either done it themselves or have had another agency in and then you come in and you, you know, have got to pick up the ball and run with it. What are the sort of the common things that you see people not quite getting right uh, around these three solutions that you provided for uh, picking your ideal client? Well, the, a few things have come up throughout this actual this conversation. One is they don't have a customer avatar at all. They have, they've never done a worksheet and they don't know who their customer is. Um, two, uh, second common mistake would be that they think that you know half of the world is their customer. And so we, we really need to work on niching down that customer into a much, much smaller uh, group of people and really identifying who is, you know some of the the basic components you know what what are the sources of information that they use what are their challenges and I'd say uh, number three would be um, that yeah they're just not identifying their customer very well and they're just having trouble with their with their marketing material so for example like facebook ads they're not seeing the the results that they want so i would say these are the the common issues that i typically see when i'm engaging with a with a sure. client and what are the things that you obvious other than the obvious what are some of the things that you see and you can quickly analyze that there's a problem with this before the owner does. So, you know, often, you know, we're doing our best, but we're not experts. That's why we've got someone like you <laughs> on here because you do it every day. But if you're you know, running a business, this is just one element of it. What, what, um, yeah, what are some of the key um, either metrics or information you look at to quickly audit whether they've got that, you know, message the market wrong or they, they haven't got the, uh, the copy right for their ideal client? Um, well, the first thing that I look at is uh, typically how clients uh, a lot of times engage with me is that they have run Facebook ads and they and it, and it has done very little for them. They have seen no results. They've seen very little engagement. And that is a good uh, point that, that tells me that there's something wrong and typically it has to do with the ideal target market. So um, the other thing would be like email marketing. If they're, if they're not getting op- like if we're getting very low open rates or click through rates, then that's an, another key indicator to me that they're probably just don't have a very good customer avatar designed at this point. So I'd say those are a couple of the things, um, the points that I see right away, which will, which we're like, okay, we got to take a step back <laughs> before we can write more emails and more Facebook copy and create more, um, more videos for Facebook. We need to, uh, we need to really hone in on the customer avatar. Yeah, and I think it's uh, often a, a bit of a balancing because I think you know the the number one thing that you need to be successful leaving corporate, running your own business is tenacity. So you know, oh you, yes, you you've been through there. You've had eleven years of it. You know, I've had around seven, but you know, there's a roller coaster, and it's probably the hardest job in the world is uh, creating your own asset and uh, running your own business. Very rewarding, but very difficult. But I find that that 
tenacity sometimes creeps into people's marketing where they just continue to do the same thing. It's like, look, if it's not working and the customer is not buying, you've got to change something. You've got to do something different. Do you see a lot of that um, in some of the clients that you work with? Absolutely. Yeah. They have something and then I come in and audit it for them. And, and then I really, I, put together a worksheet that I'm like, okay, well, these are the points that we really need to focus on. It's like, why did you say that in your email versus um, a lot of times it's not even, I mean, yes, you do need the expertise like myself, but a lot of times you can come in to a business and just really, because you have fresh eyes, really see what, what are some of the issues that, that this business has not really necessarily being like uh, an expert. I mean, yes, we are all experts in whatever it is that we do, but also just seeing it from a, from a fresh perspective that um, the business owner probably has never, hasn't seen in a long time because they're just in the business and they're in the weeds the whole time. Yeah. And, and look, uh, I certainly no back in the co company because the co company from an ideal client point of view did probably more consumer research on their clients than uh, any other company I know. And I, I used to sort of, you know, go and have workshops with um, you know, Nike, Adidas, um, Sony, etc. Some of the big brands, and uh, Coke was sort of at the, the cutting edge of that. We were leading the conversation, and uh, we constantly got experts in to get us to look at and reframe it. Um, yep. And then from there, we 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 moved it forward. I'm sure in your corporate experience, you probably did a similar thing. So I think you know the key thing out of this is is do that. Like if if you're really struggling and you can't to find your ideal client, we're going to have something great for you to start that journey, uh, which Gene's going to leave you. But also, uh, if if you're really struggling, get someone in to do that in order to help you. I think it's so critical because once you get this bit right, all the rest of it flows. You know, next you get your business model right, then sales, and then finally you can build your team, and all of a sudden you've got a really a great sustainable business. But I think this ideal client uh, piece is absolutely critical and that's why we've got Gene in today. So Gene, uh, look, that's been a, a fantastic summary. What are some examples where you can really bring this li- to life for our audience? What are some case studies you can uh, go through? Sure. Well, uh, I can um, I can give away my, I'm actually giving away my book for free and, and some of the case studies that, that we talked about today are in it and additional case studies. So um, you guys are absolutely free to get this free book. Uh, if you just go to geneginsburg.com uh, slash BLG, geneginsburg.com slash BLG, I have a whole chapter on the customer avatar. And additionally, I have another nine chapters, I think, um, that talk about all about digital marketing, talk about funnels and Facebook advertising and creating content. So, and I talk, and I have a bunch of case studies in there as well. So I uh, welcome everybody who's listening to this to grab a free copy of my book. It's in PDF format. So, um, so yeah, I, I hope you guys take advantage of that. Yeah, brilliant. Well, that's, uh, that's very kind of you, but if you just got one that you could uh, leave us with, uh, oh, just, sure. Yeah, just one client that uh, you've gone through this journey and uh, you now what was the situation they were in, what was sort of the, um, the key solution you gave them and then uh, what was the result of that? Absolutely. So I would say uh, the one I would want to use is a, a specialized skincare company that I worked with in the past. And when I first started working with them, uh, they did not have a an ideal target market or they didn't identify their ideal target market at that point. Um, there, this, uh, the person who create had, was the business owner had a, a pretty decent following in the past from his previous businesses uh, that were also in skincare. So he, uh, you know, he was making pretty good sales, but the problem was that he just didn't know who these people were who were actually purchasing from him. So we just followed everything that we talked about here in in this podcast um, episode. So we did a survey. I had him get on to a bunch of calls. We did probably he probably did thirty calls, and really, um, the first thing, of course, we we um, we talked about was just created some questions about uh, when when he was actually on the phone. What what was the reason that these individuals purchased from him? Why did they like his product so much? Because he did again, he did have a following, so. Um, so these uh, these women who are using his skincare com- uh, product were definitely um, very you know interested and were willing to definitely purchase these. Uh, this it's a, you know it was a pretty high end skincare product. So I had him get on the call, ask him qu- ask questions of his current 
customers. We sent out a survey via email, and we got a lot of really good uh, data and feedback from from his current customers. So we used that um, also to identify the ideal target market. We worked on the worksheet um, that I mentioned. So uh, we identified that these are all, most of them were women, about 80% of them were women, um, at a, and usually at a uh, age of 45 plus. Um, and then we identified what were their pain points before they started using his skincare product. So, um, typically they were having issues with their skin, um, not just like fine lines, but also things like psoriasis and, and other skincare problems. Um, and, and his products definitely address that. Um, and then we, uh, he, we also had uh, the business owner ask his clients and his uh, customers um, some of the, the points, like what are the blogs that they read, who are the gurus that they follow, events that they attend. So uh, this was extremely helpful for us to craft our message, our marketing message after we did all of this, after we had him uh, get on the phone and talk to these customers, after we created our customer avatar worksheet. So um, very helpful. And it really turned around the company because we were able to use all of this messaging and really hone in, for example, on Facebook ads and really target a certain demographic and a certain, um, uh, really use the functionality of Facebook targeting um, to get the right customers in the fold. So yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a good example of how it had having these key points and key strategies really work in, um, in, in creating the customer avatar and growing your business at the same time. Excellent. That's a, that's a great example. And, uh, just one quick question on that as, as far as, is it best that the founder calls or is it uh, better that someone independent? What's your view or experience on that? I'd say, uh, in my opinion, I think it's best if the founder calls. I mean, especially if it's a smaller company, you know, we're not talking about tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Um, you know, most of the companies, uh, business owners that I've dealt with are you know, maybe several million dollars. So, you know, the business owner is still pretty involved in the business. And I think that, um, and especially in this example, the business owner of the skincare company really was the face also of the company. So most of the customers knew him. Um, he was, you know, he was on the website. He was on um, a lot of the marketing materials. So, so also having that connection there. So he did most um, all the calls and I would say it's, it's much better rapport and connection if the business owner does the calls. Plus um, the business owner like can identify a lot of the, the nuances because they're so engrossed in the business. Uh, so I, I would say the business owner. Excellent. Great. And, uh, I think that's really good advice because I, I struggle with that one myself sometimes because I wonder, will they give me the answer I want to hear or will they give me the real answer? <laughs> but I think it also depends on the, the amount of touch points as well. So for people in our community that are sort of running, you know, masterminds, et cetera, I think sometimes it's good to get someone independent because you're so close uh, to True. that individual. Uh, but I think uh, in your case, like the skincare example you gave, I think it's it's great that the uh, the founder, because it's it's nothing better than the the brand owner uh, calls you and and asks some good open feedback. So um, that's great. Absolutely. And uh, I I had a mastermind member the other day had the uh, Rod Jury from uh, Zero uh, at a luncheon, and they said the most impressive thing was was just how passionate he was about finding out how he can improve his product. So, you know, obviously a very successful product, especially in, in Asia, Australia and New Zealand, uh, doing well in the US, but he was just so passionate about, you know, what do you like, but what don't you like? What can we do to fix? And uh, I think mm -hmm. that's brilliant where the owner is uh, is that that passionate about the end solution. So, uh, look, uh, it, it's been brilliant having you on today. Um, as you said, you've kindly given us a free copy of your book. So if they go to Gene Ginsburg dot com forward slash blg they'll get the yep. pdf we'll also have all the other links and comments that you mentioned we'll also have those in the uh, show notes so people can uh, find you through there uh what's some uh, parting advice you've got for a uh, people um, blg uh, community that's listening to this podcast absolutely um i'd say 
lifelong learning is is my usually my parting advice for for any uh, podcasts or speaking engagements I've done. Um, I think it's important to always continue on learning, um, reading books, going through digital courses, um, because it's uh, no matter how old we are, there's always things that we don't know. And um, being an entrepreneur, I think one of the qualities of being an entrepreneur is that you always have to continue on learning. Excellent. So uh, if you like this content from uh, Gene today, I know I've certainly got a huge amount of value from it and you'd like access to more content like this and also a really supportive community of corporate escapees building their dream business, then just go to buildlivegive.com and uh, we will uh, you know, bring you in, support you. And uh, as Gene uh, and I mentioned, it, it's, uh, it's a brilliant journey, but it's uh, certainly difficult and it's certainly difficult if you're doing it alone. So if you want to join a great community, just go to buildlivegift.com. So Gene, I'd love to uh, thank you for being on the BLG Experts today. And I really appreciate your uh, knowledge that you shared and also your experiences and, uh, you know, hope to uh, have lots of our community come and, and ask you further around how they can develop their ideal client. Absolutely. It was such a pleasure and an honor to be here today. And I hope that your audiences, everybody listening to this episode, got some good information. Excellent. Great. Thanks a lot, Jane. Thank you. If you're enjoying listening to our guest stories, just letting you know we have a community for corporate escapees who are rapidly growing their dream business to find freedom. Just like you, it's called BLG Boost. You get exclusive access to a forum of like-minded peers answering your most pressing questions. You get actionable tips to solve your most common challenges. You get hundreds of trusted suppliers to save you time and money. You get member-only discounts. You get direct access to coaching by a global leader in the field and easy to implement content solving common topics mentioned in popular threads. If you are tired of being alone and are seeking the freedom of running your own business whilst meeting your financial goals, go to buildlivegive.com forward slash webinar. In case you missed it, the link will be in the show notes. Please check it out. Thank you for listening to the Corporate Escapees podcast, brought to you by the team at Build, Live, Give. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with other corporate escapees. If you would like to join a community of like-minded peers, please visit www.buildlivegive.com. Until next time, thanks for listening and be brave.